Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Rick Steves Tours Festival of Europe. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the pleasure of being your moderator this evening as we take a tour through the cosmopolitan cities and charming countryside of France with our host, Steve Smith, and a very special guest. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce a part-time French resident, co-author of our France guidebook, and the OG Rick Steves Europe France tour guide, Steve Smith. <laughs> Steve, over to you. I like it, Gabe. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. I, it's about time this festival got to France, by the way. I've been chomping at the bit to get you off to this country and thank all the viewers for tuning in so that we can show you this country that we have fallen in love with. Oh, let's share a screen here. Let's get going. All right. Um, this is a picture of our tour guides, which reminds me that the most important part, I think, of any successful trip, or certainly a very important part, is the guide that you have either leading your tour, and we spend a lot of time trying to train and, and develop the best guides we have, or the guide leading your private tour of a museum in Paris. And when, re when I'm researching guidebooks, I look for top guides in either category. This also... This image is of the, uh, the fun that we still have coming in front of us. There's seven more shows or six more, I think. Um, after France, it's a definite drop. Just kidding. Ireland, Germany, Switzerland, Netherlands are all coming up. And if you like reruns, you can tune in to uh, any of them and see them as many times as you want at ricksteves.com. Right? And if you are a... Um, First time, uh, if you've been watching any of these shows, you're eligible to win a city, a free city tour, providing you sign into the ricksteves.com giveaway um, uh, online site. And you might, with any luck at all, you could win a tour, a week long tour to Paris, sparkling Istanbul, ancient Rome, or lovely London. Save $100 a person by signing up for a tour during the month of January. And I like this image. This just takes me right there. I, I, just, man, that's perfect. We have, speaking of tours, we have five different tours that uh, we're going to be covering tonight for you. The Best of Paris in a Week, The Heart of France in 11 Days, which is probably with Paris, Three Nights in Paris, probably the most historic tour we do. A Western France tour of the Loire Valley to the south of France, an Eastern France tour passing through some of my favorite regions in Eastern France, and a My Way tour that I'll be guiding this year um, for independent travelers who just kind of want to be left alone but want the security of a bus and a hotel and breakfast on the way and the services of somebody like me to be your assistant guide or your escort. Here's a map of Europe that helps us situate where France is, right? It's in the center of Europe. It doesn't suffer from the extreme heat of the south nor the cold of the north. It's a mild climate. Wine, food, grow well here. And you'll see all the tours that we offer on this map of Europe. The blue ones, I think that's blue. I'm kind of colorblind. But I think those are ones that pass just through France. And you'll notice a couple of other lines of our best of Europe tours that pass two or three days in this great country of France. To orient you a little bit to the size of this country, France is about 80% the size of Texas with two and a half times as many people. North to south or east to west, it's pretty much 600 miles either way you go. If you look at, I'm gonna move this cursor to see Paris down to Aix-en-Provence, that's an hour flight. It's a three hour bullet train and 11 hour drive in your car. Don't drive long distances in France, take the train or the plane. Ah -ha. <laughs> Some things don't change. For 36 years, I have been teaching Rick the art of French living while he has patiently taught me the science of guidebook writing and tour guiding. Together with our expert editing staff, we have created books, maps, podcasts, audio guided tours, anything, phrase books that we can get our hands on to help independent travelers navigate this beautiful country. Speaking of beautiful country, here's where you are, monumental France. It's blessed with such a variety of scenery from, from exquisite Paris in the North, dramatic to, well, wait, skip one there, to the Riviera capital of Nice, sparkling in the Southern Eastern part of the country. You'll pass pastoral scenery in the North, like here in Normandy, to rock sculpted villages in the South of Provence, You'll also see two distinctly different coastlines if you enjoy this country. The Atlantic 
its rugged coastline, which faces over to jolly England on the western limit, and the warm, balmy waters of the Mediterranean, hospitable to cactus and other desert-like plants. Such different looks at oceans and seas. Does France have two opportunities for that? And if, by chance, you are insist on seeing the tallest mountains in Europe, you must go to France, not Switzerland, and go to Chamonix and glide over or past Mont Blanc, 15,770 feet tall, the centerpiece of the Alps that border the eastern edge of France. But France has two other brilliant mountain ranges, the Pyrenees, which guard the access to Spain on its southwestern corner side, and the, uh, the Massif Central, central mountain range, home to Europe's greatest canyons, like this one, the Grand Canyon of Verdun, all covered in our guidebooks are all these magnificent sites. And these magnificent sites remind me that this geographic diversity has lent itself over the centuries to a cultural diversity. So for what that makes, I think, France such an interesting place to go. One day you could be in this Hansel and Gretel village, enjoying pedestrian only streets in the Alsace region of France, eating sauerkraut smothered with fat hot dogs, big hunks of ham and potatoes. Complemented by a, a glass of very dramatic Riesling or a Gewurztraminer wine, for example. Well, the next day you could cross over to the Atlantic Ocean, 600 miles due west, and run into lads like this who look more Irish than French because they are more Irish than French in the Celtic region of Brittany, where who's who shoe crude in this region, I guess you could say, these kids are raised on crepes just like this. And they probably haven't had a bite of sauerkraut, I bet in their lives or not in a long time anyway. In the Southwestern corner of France, locals look muy Spanish and paella is on most menus. And in the Southeastern corner, which was Italy until the 1860s, locals deliver that happy-go-lucky Italian, what's o'clock, what's on time, fun attitude and pasta Fresh pasta is in most storefront windows. Now, I would like to introduce you to, okay, to my partner in crime for this talk tonight, Virginie Moret. Welcome, Virginie. Bonjour to everybody. Bonjour, Steve. Or I should say bonsoir for you. Yeah. It's, so, quite, it's quite early for me. I mean, it's, uh, it's three in the morning, but I'm here and uh, hello, everybody. You look great for three in the morning. I remember I had to do that once and that, that was run, one rough run, but bless you for doing it. And thank you for taking the time to do this, Virginie. Are you oh, able to have something to drink tonight? Of course. I mean, at three in the morning, there is no other time better than uh, having a glass of where I am here in uh, the southern part of Burgundy, border yep. with Beaujolais. I'm having a glass of uh, Gamay Great Beaujolais. So santé to everybody. I hope all of us watching, uh, all of uh, you watching us can have a glass too. So santé. What santé. are you drinking, Steve? Well, this is fun to tell people. You and I are neighbors because I just live a little bit north of you when I have my foot in France, in, in, in the heart of the wine country of Burgundy. I decided to have a Kier tonight. I don't know if you can tell by the color here. This is just a very small dapple of Kier, um, a, a, a very deep cassis berry uh, liqueur mixed with a white wine. Cheers, Virginie. And to everybody okay. watching us. Um, all right, so let's go. Let's go back to let's to to our show. And all right, and I I hired Virginie to guide tours. I don't know, it was a seven or eight years ago, and was delighted to find out she's an ACE researcher. Virginie is the person I rely on the most to help me update guidebooks, and the person when I did tour assignments that I would assign tours to most in France when I could get her time. And she is going to help me. Throughout this talk, we're going to team uh, do this thing back and forth between the two of us, taking you on a trip throughout the country of France that we love so much. We're going to start with a week in Paris. We have tours in Paris that run all year round. Paris is a great city from summer to winter. Summer, it's outdoor everything. Uh, get air conditioning in your room because it's probably going to be warm. Winter is light, sparkling, cozy cafes, museums so far less crowded, and temperatures that nothing but a couple layers of, of good clothing can't overcome. Uh, we run tours of Paris year round, and you, if you're independent travelers, should definitely consider it in the off season when airplane flights are cheaper, and the locals are just that much more relaxed to see a tourist, and they actually get a seat on their metro. All right, Virginie, will you take us on a little visit to the city, would you? 
Yes, let's make sure that you are busy in Paris. So uh, if you only had one day in Paris and only one walk to do, I would go for the historic walk. That's the first one we have in the guidebook. And it starts where it all started over 2000 years ago on the Ile de la Cité, which is right in the middle of Paris on the Seine River. And you see it, uh, you know, centuries of history. Notre Dame in 2023 would have been uh, first year, 860 years ago, the first stone. And um, I, I must say, this is very moving for me to see it like this because I led the last Rick Steves tour that went uh, inside the cathedral on that April day of 2019. So it's very moving. And today, of course, you can only see the exterior. You cannot go in. But just a few blocks away, you can enjoy the triumph of Gothic architecture by visiting the Saint Chapelle, which was within the Palace of the King. And when you step inside the Saint Chapelle, I mean, this is it. Whoa. That's that's yeah. the feeling that all of my uh, travelers have. You just your your head naturally goes up. You look up. There is so much light. It's overwhelming. Uh, with over six thousand and five hundred square feet of stained glass window dating from the Middle Ages, you're going to be dazzled for sure. And so there is a lot of history to see on the Ile de la Cité. I and wanted course, to, to add, Virginie, well, I think they still do concerts almost every night, don't they, within that they, chapel? They, they do concert, and it's, I mean, less people, and it's, uh, I was able to go a couple of times, and it's, if you're, if you're able to do that, I mean, you have to plan ahead on lots of things, it's a big city, but this is something that you remember for a lifetime. Exactly. And so we have more sites on the Ile de la Cité, and you're going to see, you know, the work going on on the, on the cathedral. Our president said the day it burned, and he said that again in uh, this winter, that it will reopen in a certain way in 2024. Uh, but once you're done with the Ile de la Cité, you're going to cross the River Seine, and you're going to be on the left bank. And the left bank has been and still is the artistic and intellectual spirit of the city. As you can see with the Shakespeare and Company bookstore that has attracted American writers uh, since the beginning of the 20th century. And this is in the Latin Quarter. And when you walk through the Latin Quarter, the end of your walk will lead you to the Luxembourg Gardens because you do have the right to rest your tired feet in this city with a beautiful garden and just enjoy those chairs watch the Parisians what I love to do there is just you know look at the the fountain and you'll see kids playing with uh, you know toy boats sailboats pushing them with a stick and they're not playing with an iPad that and that's the beauty of Paris this also reminds me Virginie that I want to remind American travelers to stop, slow down, pace yourself. France rewards travelers who choose a slower pace. Be Parisian, watch and imitate. Grab a chair. These chairs are free for you to use. Take two of them for your feet if you must, but slow down and enjoy the pace of life. It's, it's a beautiful city and uh, you actually are not far from the Louvre Museum and talk about history. This was the second Palace of the King after the Saint Chapelle area. And what I love about visiting the Louvre is that you get to see the modern Paris and then centuries of, uh, of art and history. Now, when you go to the Louvre, you have to have a plan because with over 30,000 pieces of artwork, you cannot see it all, or you have to come back and come back, which is not a problem, but you <laughs> want to use a guidebook, hire a local guide, and see the highlights. The Venus of Milo is one of those. I mean, this is the golden Greece, and you turn around this statue, you have the harmony, the balance. It's just, you know, pure art. Now, another famous lady of the Louvre is, of yeah. course, the Mona Lisa. And um, she won't leave you indifferent. You may think she's tiny, but for sure, you'll have to have a look at it. Uh, now, you can spend hours in the Louvre. And after that, you need to be able to enjoy the outside of Paris. Just a few blocks away from the Louvre is the Marais neighborhood with the beautiful Place des Vosges and all of those aristocratic mansions. And the beauty of Paris is in the outdoor. This is a very trendy neighborhood with art galleries, cafes, shops, but it's still full of history. Uh, this used to be, and is still today, uh, the Jewish neighborhood of uh, Paris. So you will be walking into uh, scenes of people, you know, uh, in uh, you know Jewish people, and it's also the gay uh, neighborhood of Paris. So uh, very lively in the evening. Now, my favorite neighborhood, 
I love the Marais, but my favorite is Montmartre. Uh, so you leave the river, you go up the hill. The hill used to have uh, vines. Of course, it still has actually some uh, gamay, talking about wine. They still have a vineyard at the top. So I'll get a drink here. <laughs> and then the vines, you know, it was mostly vines. They were replaced by wheat fields uh, to feed the Parisians with uh, you know, the bread. And then by the late 18. 100, it became the place where the artistic went and where modern art was invented with Picasso. Now at the top on the Place du Tertre, you may have the soon-to-be Picasso or the soon-to-be Renoir artist. You may meet them here. And this is actually where Renoir painted the famous Bal au Moulin de la Guinguette. So this, this catches the, the spirit of Montmartre, what the artists were looking for. And of course, today it's different, but you still get that glimpse of a village life when you are in Montmartre. And actually the people who live in Montmartre, even though it's part of Paris, they don't call themselves Parisians. Uh, they call themselves the Montmartrois, which might be the hardest word you, you ever try to say. Can you say it, Steve? Montmartrois. Montmartrois. And you know, thanks, <laughs> I can. And I, this just reminds me, what I love about France is you can go to these places, um, like the Moulin de la Galette, that inspired those rebels, those impressionist artists to paint in the style they did and be moved the same way they were, even if the costumes have changed over the years, right? And so th this painting, then you go back down uh, the hill and go back to the riverside and you arrive at the Orsay Museum where this painting is. Now, this is art from 1848 to World War I when the Louvre was anything that was before. And that's where you'll see impressionism with artists, artists such as Degas, Van Gogh, Gauguin. And, uh, and the building itself, this is a more relaxed museum than the Louvre, it's smaller, and it's an old train station that was built in 1900, so just for engineers, it's just nice to go to that museum too. Mm -hmm. And then we, get, give you to, we get you to another museum, also just on the other side of the river, focusing on the big, the masterpieces of Monet, those eight huge water lilies. And I mean, I live in the countryside, small village surrounded by vineyards. So sometime when I'm in Paris, I need to go back and, you know, inst go into a garden or go to that museum because it feels like a dream uh, as if you were floating among those water lilies. So that's my to go uh, museum when I need a, a little bit of a breeze uh, in Paris. So I think we got you a bit busy uh, with all of this. Anything else, Steve, that we could do well in, uh, in Paris? I love that that thematic way of travel. So this is an impressionist day. So you go up to the top of Montmartre, right? You see what inspired them to paint the way they did, and then you can visit the two museums, and even a third that you mentioned, the Orsay and the Orangerie, and a third one, by the way, that we just don't have time to cover much, the Rodin Museum, to the sculptor who did for for sculpture what those artists did for painted art. Yeah, wow, that is that is fun stuff, man. How you doing? I'm doing super well. It's not three in the morning. I feel like going to Paris right now. All right. Now, this is, I'll take over for, <laughs> I do. You know, we both love that city, but we also love going back to our homes in the quiet countryside, don't we? Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, I, I lived, when I was re first researching books with Rick on France, lived in this neighborhood just off the Rue Claire, pedestrian only street that we highlight in our books and on our tours. A lot of our tours stay in this area. It's a great way. We, in, in fact, Rick liked it so much. He does an audio tour and a self-guided walk in our Paris book, teaching Americans the art of Parisian living, French living through the eyes and in the, the storefronts. Um, of a street like Rue Claire. It's a great place to base yourself because just minutes away on foot, you can wander to the Eiffel Tower um, and see one of uh, its three views from first level, second level, I'm pointing with my finger, uh, all the way to the top level and get great views over Paris. Important about the Eiffel Tower, it's crowded, you'll always get in, but you may have to stay in line for a long time. So book ahead, they accept reservations up to three months. And if you can book ahead, book at the end of the day as this person has done, and you'll get to see the lights twinkle on if you time it just right, right? And um, that, and you can stay up on the Eiffel Tower. There's restaurants and there's lots of ways to, to occupy your time. Looking just east of the Eiffel Tower to the awesome Invalide, Louis XIV's military hospital. Today is one of Europe's greatest military hospitals where you can 
tour over 1,000 years of war. Most impressive section, though, I think, and we spend a lot of time in our guidebook on it, is about World War II, World War I and World War II. So impressively um, displayed in this museum, in this museum, converted hospital to museum. And under that golden dome lies powerfully dead the tomb of Napoleon, a uh, goose bumping <laughs> kind of experience for most Americans to learn about this amazing person we've always heard the name of, but we don't know much about. And just a short, well, 15 minute walk north of, of the Rue Claire area lies the uh, top of the Champs Elysees and the Arc de Triomphe, very well worth the 420 steps to the top because the view at the top is magnificent in all directions. I'm just showing you down the heart of the Champs Elysees, which at the end, by the way, ends at the gardens of the Louvre. And it makes a great long walk. And we, in fact, liked it so much, we do a self-guided tour in our Paris book of a walk on the Champs Elysees past stylish shops, uh, monumental uh, storefronts and glittering cafes. Paris, it, they call it the city of light for good reason. You've got to get out in the late evening. I mentioned the Eiffel Tower before, but get on one of these boats, uh, one of these bateau mouches. We do it on our tours, right, Virginie? We we, we go about yeah. this time of day, do we? Yes, we do uh, go at the end of the day when the, the light is changing. And this is just a the great perspective of the city because you get to see it from the river and it gives you a, a perspective of, of the of the city. Mm, yeah, and it's absolutely glorious at night. Um, this it reminds me we in our in our books we we give you lots of options whether it's by boat, bus with dinner you can do that, uh, rent your own taxi and we provide the route for you in our guidebooks to see the city at night uh, in so many different ways and it's just you you just can't go to sleep every night in Paris you've got to get out and see the city at night and I think any trip to the center part of Paris ends well at the Place du Trocadero with this grand view over the Eiffel Tower. And from Paris you do have day trips excursions that you can do and of course maybe the most famous one is going to Versailles just one hour door to door from your hotel room to the palace of the kings, the main kings that live there, Louis XIV, 15, and 16. For a hundred years, this was the European heartbeat of a uh, cultural heartbeat of Europe. Mm -hmm. And so when you visit the palace, it's going to be a series, a succession of bright, furnished, lavish rooms leading you to the Hall of Mirrors. Now, mirrors were super expensive at the time. So it shows you the power that Louis XIV impressed onto his, onto his people. And from the palace, you have beautiful views of the gardens because uh, Louis XIV felt like God. You know, French style gardens, man has to impose order over nature. And wherever uh, you are, you have a beautiful view of the palace from the gardens and you can spend the whole afternoon there. It's and Versailles is also a very neat town, um, of course, much smaller than uh, than Paris and quite relaxing. But then, if you really want to get away and get to a mid-sized town, hey, Virginie, before you yeah. go, this just reminds me. Pardon me for interrupting you, but this is an important tip for independent travelers and for anybody on our tours. If it does not cover it on the tour, these sites like Versailles and the Louvre and the Eiffel Tower, book ahead, right? Book these ahead because since since uh, COVID, they are limiting the number of visitors and you're so smart to not stand in line and book a reservation ahead. And it's very easy to do. Yeah. And, and you know, study, do your homework before. I mean, that's the fun of planning a, a trip. You know, maybe you want to use a museum pass. The museum pass works for, for uh, entering into Versailles also. You were about no. to say <laughs> the museum pass won't get you there because you're going to get into a mid-sized town, very pleasant town, uh, an hour away from Paris by train. And you have to use the train uh, system when you are in France. And it's Chartres is famous from its cathedral. We actually start uh, the Loire to the south of France tour starts in Chartres. And uh, we get to visit the cathedral, which is the, the best example of pure Gothic architecture. Mm -hmm. And it was recently renovated. It's beautiful. And you want to make sure that you pack your binoculars for that tour, because you want to get close to those stained glass windows. I mean, two thirds of them date from the 13th century. And so you'll have lots of stories to, to read, uh, stories of the Bible. But what I would do is not just visit the cathedral in Chartres. Uh, it's worth staying, uh, you know, overnight. It has a lovely, uh, very photogenic town just by the small uh, river that you see here. And by staying overnight, you get the chance to see 
the beautiful sound and light show that we have over dozens of buildings in the city. Now, the main uh, attraction of the show is over the cathedral. And I know when I start this tour, you know, my travelers, they are jet lagged. And if it's June, they don't want to stay until 11 o'clock to go see that show, you know, sound and light show. It's going to be tacky. It is far from being tacky. We I have agree. schools of engineers in France just working on those sun and, and light show. And people always say it's worth staying up. Don't you think so, Steve? Absolutely. I love Chartres. I just oh. really like stay. It's a lovely town. Um, in fact, I, yeah, I, it, I, yeah. And we, uh, it's, it's, a, it's also, it's a place that's worth hiring a guide, I think, independently or with our tours. I think we use a guide to understand this, this truly important Gothic cathedral, right? And I'll take us outside the region of Paris now. Let's go due west. What do you say? Let's get out of the city and into the countryside following the Seine River West. It's a glorious drive into the, into, oops, we just went one too fast, to the small village of, uh, just on the tip of Normandy, that's where we're going, due west of Paris, to visit the home of Claude Monet at Giverny, that G is soft, uh, what I like to call the Camp David of Impressionism, where Claude Monet spent the last 40 years of his life cultivating his flowers and his art that you can appreciate today. Best to reserve ahead, strategize. You can day trip it from Paris, Paris perfectly well. I think our books do a good job covering that or use it as a stopover en route to destinations further west, like about an hour and a half or two hours, pardon me, further west to the beautiful city of Bayeux. If you're on your way to the D-Day beaches, I think this town makes probably the best base for visiting the D-Day beaches from, but there are other good ones too, with a, a cathedral that's far outsized for the small town of 10,000 people that looks mostly like this with that grand cathedral. And so shockingly with some Power for a small town as it is, heavyweight sites like the Bayou Tapestry, the, the 70 yard long linen embroidery that tells us frame by frame of the dramatic victory of uh, William the Conqueror over Harold at the Battle of Hastings, launching France and England into 400 years of conflict not to be resolved until the Hundred Years' War. But for most people, I think Bayou is the jumping off point, just minutes from the D-Day beaches. The first city to be liberated by the allies, by the American allies, in fact, was Bayeux. The D-Day beach coast, 45, 50, I'm sorry, 54 mile long coast is lined. It's, a, it's, it's so peaceful today. When I look at this image, it is just, it just reminds me how things can change, right? And you can still see memories though, boy, as you wander those 50 miles of coastline of military embattlements. Brilliant museums, honestly, the it, it, and for Americans, you guys, this is one part of Europe where your history is involved. You're going to see and be well received because Americans had a lot to do with the liberation of France and Europe and started right here on the D-Day beaches for much of, of that liberation. Museum to the paratroopers here in St. Mary Glace is a powerful good site to visit. I love seeing the uh, the museum at the at Ahomash where the artificial harbor was constructed overnight, surprising the Germans who thought we would have they, they would have taken an existent port and the, the visiting the village today. I think some of our tours even stay in this village too, Virginie. Um, and I, you can see the break. Go ahead, Virginie, will you? No, we do stay in Aromanche. And I must tell you, this is, you know, uh, I was there uh, several times actually on D-Day and it's super moving to, you know, the tide recedes and you get to see the remnants from the, the artificial harbor uh, that was actually created there. And even though this is more than 70 years ago, uh, you just see the history right there. So it's a very, uh, it's a very moving, uh, moving trip. On the Heart of France tour, we spend a full day um, on the, the D-Day area. And I, I love staying in Aromanche. It's a great place. You know, Virginia, it just reminds me, I've never asked this, but for Americans, it's powerful because we had a lot to do with it. And, you know, Tom Hanks made a movie about it. And so did John Wayne. But for the French, is it the same? Is it is it as moving as it is to Americans, do you think? It, it is part of our history. It's, mm -hmm. um, I mean, as a kid, you know, we learn from a textbook. And when we learn about World War II, we actually do a field trip. I grew up not far from there. And that's where we would go. It is moving. And I mean, people still thank American uh, these days when uh, when they see yeah. them in, in, in Normandy, yeah. in that part of Normandy. I love it. All right. Uh, OK. I think that there's no more important place to have a local guide, though, than for these D-Day beaches. And here you see a tour group, much like what Virginie would lead, right? Um, 
Go ahead. They are, if, I, if I may, Steve, they are, uh, I mean, on our Heart of France tour, we only spend one day. I mean, you could spend a week just going over all of the museums. And But when if you only had one day, I would say go for a local guide. They're going to bring life to the sites that you're seeing rather than going to a museum. I, I would I'm, say that's just, the, that's just the highlight for the tour for many of our travelers. And when I update guidebooks, I'm go, always going with guides and testing guides in our guidebooks. And families hire them. It is expensive and it is worth it for Americans to see this, this, these beaches, like the Pointe du Hawk, where the rangers, 200 rangers, scaled these cliffs to take out six guns, six 155 millimeter guns that the Germans had up, up on the top of those cliffs is powerfully moving, but really moving if you have a local guide to explain that story to you. Ending your day at the powerful American cemetery where over 9,400 white crosses and stars of David glimmer um, in memory, just above the cliffs of the eye of the D-Day storm, above Omaha Beach at the American Cemetery. And if you end your day here at five o'clock, every day of the week, there's an Im impressive flag ceremony. And Virginie, well, where are we going now? Yep, let's go a little bit further west from where uh, you left us in Normandy and standing on its own in the bay is the famous Mont Saint-Michel. It's the uh, most visited site in France outside of Paris. But the good thing is that you do not have to wait for that tide to go away like on this image to reach the Mont Saint-Michel because as for the last few years, they've had a slick causeway leading you to this island where there's been an abbey, a Benedictine abbey for a thousand years. And so you'll get to explore the village. It's uh, traffic free, uh, lots of pilgrims. It was a top pilgrimage site in the Middle Ages. And you want to make sure that uh, you go to the top and actually visit the abbey itself. Only about 50% of people who go to the Mont Saint-Michel actually make it to the inside of the, the interior of the abbey. And, you know, grab our guidebook, hire a local guide. But I mean, it's in, impressive to understand how they were able to build such a structure on top of a rock. I mean, this was nicknamed at the time by the pilgrims in the Middle Ages, the Marvel, in French, La Merveille, because when they would see it from a distance, they would just be marveled by it. So, and you'll feel that way too. And you want to go backwards quickly, yep. just to say, arrive, I like this rhyme, arrive after five. Avoid exactly. the first jam and spend the night like we do at the Hotel Mouton Blanc or where we sleep on the island or sleep within a short hop of the island so you can do this, right? That's exactly what you want to do because uh, you want to enjoy less crowds. We we arrive around four-ish and then we leave in the morning with the groups and we're divided into small hotels because of course there is no major big hotel on the island. And then we get to enjoy the, the next view that's coming uh, at night it's just perfect. And if you time it well, I mean, don't don't spend too much time trying to time the, the super tide. But I've been lucky to be on the island uh, when it's super tide. And it actually becomes an island, again, surrounded wa by water. And you actually, if you wanted to leave, you have to wade through this much of, of water. It's just, it's just moving. I mean, I grew up not far from there. And each time I go back there, I just, you know, it's, it's wall. I, I just love the Mont Saint-Michel. But so I grew back, uh, I grew back not far away. And uh, actually an hour away from the Mont Saint-Michel in Brittany, which has to be the, the less explored part of France, the Celtic part of France. Uh, it's culturally very, very different. The language, the, the culture, the food. I actually uh, was born 10 minutes away from the town of Dinan. You see the lower part of Dinan. And Dinan is a great base uh, if, you're, if you're driving a car to explore Brittany. Uh, beautiful half Tiber houses where you see a creperie with another creperie and another creperie. Uh, <laughs> as you can see on the, on the sign here. You, go, you don't get tired of those. It's like pizza, right? And um, and then you uh, explore the coast. And this coast, we call it the Emerald Coast, like Côte d'Emerald because of the, the color of the sea. Uh, it's uh, immense cliffs, beautiful white uh, beaches and historic sites like you have here of the castle of the Fort La Latte. So this is my, my place where we don't go there on tour yet, right? Yeah. Um, but I love to research because when I research in uh, book research, 
for Rick in Brittany. It just gives me a different perspective, a different look on the, the place where I grew up. So where are you taking us next, uh, Steve? Because I leave you in Brittany, otherwise I'll go forever. <laughs> Let's go about four hours south and a little bit to the center of the country, to the land of a thousand castles. Strategically located sort of halfway between Paris and the Atlantic Ocean, the Loire Valley is home to kings and queens, fun summer resorts and hunting lodges. The town you're looking at here is Amboise and its castle that was home to Francois I, the King of France in the early 1500s makes a great base. It's a neat little town with two important sites for your sightseeing if you um, just staying within the town. This the chateau that you can see above that we do a nice guided tour of and <laughs> this wild picture of the, the resting home of Leonardo da Vinci who spent the last three years of his life in Amboise when Italy was kind of a crazy place. He was moved up here by King Francois I and everything Italian was popular, including Leonardo da Vinci, where he could just create for the King of France. I like to say he just, Francois I brought him up to Amboise just to be smart for him and create. And this, you can visit his home, the Clos Luce, the House of Light, and all, and so many of the inventions, wild inventions, even like the space capsule, the tank that this guy thought of from the storm patterns of his brain 500 years ago. What you're looking at here is this sort of octopus-like slingshot used for military purposes. I'm not sure it was ever used that way, but they've recreated a lot of his inventions from drawings that he made. Nearby, why Amboise makes a good base just 15 minutes away, the Toast of the Loire, the elegant and the wonderful Chateau de Chenonceau arcs over the Cher River and makes a, an important stop to do first because crowds are important. Book this one ahead if you can. It is. It has, I wanna say, just the most brilliantly situated, lovely gardens and brilliant rooms to visit on the inside. My favorite, I'm just gonna show you this one is the is the uh, kitchen, of course, but you'll see beautiful, beautifully decorated Renaissance rooms. Most of these palaces were built after the invention of gunpowder. So they're just pleasure palaces, nice places to live. And speaking of nice places to live, <laughs> this is the king's hunting lodge, not home, hunting lodge, where in hunting season, maybe he'd spend a few days or a few weeks. Chambord Chateau, Chateau de Chambord, 440 rooms, 365 chimneys, a lot of chimneys because hunting is best when the leaves fall from the trees, which is in the winter and it's cold. So you have a lot of heat to help you out. I love, you, tourists can walk on the rooftop there and see and, and poke about all those chimneys and spires and enjoy a truly magnificent castle with rooms fit for a king at Chambord. You don't have to worry about crowds here. It's big enough to disperse those crowds easily. For some contrast um, to Amboise in the area around Amboise, head south by about an hour, hour and 20 minutes and set up here. Uh, we have different tours that do both, I think, don't we, Virginia, that some stay in Amboise and then some use Chinon here as their base. And I like this town. I, 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 this is talk about off the beaten path. And the, uh, uh, not only do I like the town, but this castle is obviously built for defensive purposes. And here, Eleanor of Aquitaine, Richard the Lionheart, and Joan of Arc all have a history that's important to understand in this town. Mostly, though, we like Chinon for its base because you can get out close by and tour more magnificent Renaissance, Renaissance pardon me, chateau like Azé le Rideau floating on its reflective pond just beautifully with sumptuous furniture and an interior to die for. And the Landry Chateau, not much to see on the inside, but gardens galore are in this area around Chino, make great uh, day trips from the town of Chino. And I, um, I, again, our tours do, this reminds me, uh, it's just marvelous to be able to incorporate what we do in research guidebooks into the itineraries on our tours. And, oh, and you sorry. You are not going to be castled out in France. We do have lots of castles. I get the, the Loire Valley is nicknamed the, the Valley of a Thousand Chateaux. And where I'm taking you now is further south in the Dordogne Valley, where we have other castles, but completely different, not for entertainment this time, but for pure defense. And so the Dordogne Valley is that blend of natural and man-made beauties. You have uh, fields of walnut orchards, cliffs, um, forest, and then that beautiful river that during the Hundred Years' War separated uh, France with England when the English had a foot in France. It's no longer the case, but... <laughs> and so when you discover this region, which feels really far away, um, you want to you know, be based in a city like Sarla, especially if you don't have a car, because the train gets to Sarla. If you want to explore more, though, the best is to, um, 
to, uh, to rent a car in the area. And uh, Sarla is just beautiful. It has seductive, small alleys. It's pedestrian friendly. And you want to time your visit. And everywhere in France, you want to think about when is market day. And on Sarla, it's on Wednesday or Saturday. And each time I'm in Sarla on tour, and if I, I'm on the phone with my mom, she'll say, oh, you're in Sarla. Don't you remember as a kid we brought you there? Of course, I don't remember. But now... <laughs> As an adult, I do get to enjoy the beauty of the of the market. And on the next slide, I think you have Steve here. I mean, look at that. The the variety of saucisson, what you what you call salami. No, do you call it salami? I mean, what a name, no. Saucisson. <laughs> uh, I don't know how many varieties you have here, but uh, okay. Sarla Dordogne is for the gourmet. I mean, we have geese and ducks, uh, truffles, uh, other types of mushrooms, uh, you know, walnut, strawberries, and very uh, strong, full-bodied wine. But uh, it's not just an area for gourmet. We also have history that goes back many, many thousands of years ago. Uh, it's the highest concentration of prehistoric sites in the world, in the Dordogne. This is where first cro was discovered. And the word cro is actually coming from the local language. It means big caves and you get to choose from several caves and the history the prehistory buffs will you won't get tired uh, you could choose from going to the world famous Lascaux with paintings that are 18,000 years old and of course today you see a replica and the replica was just opened in 2017 top-notch technology top-notch science artist I mean uh, never I've never been in the real cave but it, it looks as if it would be the real cave or you can decide to go to a um, maybe lesser known cave, if I must say, uh, like the Grotte of Rufignac, the cave of Rufignac, where this is where you we go on our uh, on our tour. And I must say, sometimes I have people like, oh yeah, prehistory, okay. And then we, we get on a little train, all of us, you know, like train from the 1960s, and it's all dark, and we arrive at the end of the cave, and the guy takes a torch and lit the ceiling. Yeah. And here you're face to face, with like a rhino like this, that's been engraved in the rock by our ancestor 15,000 years ago. And it's moving. Even if you don't know anything about prehistory, being face to face with the first art, I, I mean, I, I just love it. So this is the, the prehistory in action, but also you, you want to have some, some fun, huh? not just the prehistory stuff. And the Dordogne River is just refreshing and you go uh, downstream, you see beautiful castles on both sides of the river. And it, it creates a, a group spirit on our tours. It's just a, a, lot, a lot of fun. And then you'll end uh, the kind of- I had to stop yet. This is yeah. funny. I'm looking at this image. This was the first ever France tour done really? in every year I did that in. And this is the tour group from that year. And I had kayaked it before, but net canoe but never with a group. That was that was a trippy experience. Can I make it down with 25 people behind me? Can well, I? Well, we, we do lose some people, but it's okay, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, and let's let it. And then, you know, we end, as you know, at, at the Chateau de Bainac, just a great way to end. But yeah. that region, this region of the Dordogne is, people always ask me my favorite region regions in France. And I don't want to say, but boy, this has to be one of them. It's just so, your first image, just so naturally beautiful, right? And you have those caves, I mean, up to 30,000 year old uh, paintings. I mean, that's mind boggling for most people in the world to imagine. And then you can have some fun, just as you said, on those kayaks. And I so where are you taking us now? We're leaving Southwestern France. No, I think we, we have, we're not done with Southwestern France. You know, no, you're still the, going, girl. The, yeah. uh, no, I mean, in, talk about imposing castle. The, this is the fortress, the world fortress of Europe, the town of Carcassonne. Uh, it's it's huge, and I love going there. And uh, especially, I mean, uh, as a guide, but as a book researcher, what I love to do is finding those perfect hotels. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, Steve, this this is it. I mean. I love my job as a guide. I love my job as a book researcher. We find beautiful hotels like this with this view, great staff, perfect food for you to enjoy the city and uh, be able to rest. And so when you go to Carcassonne, it's also another um, another town where you know it attracts lots of people. So it's good to plan your trip and maybe stay overnight. Uh, the only big site is actually seeing the, the walls and maybe visiting the, the castles. And then of course, you're going to eat. And this is the only 
place in France, the southwest, where I will have this cassoulet. Uh, it's hearty food. It's a white bean stew with meat, and you drink the local red wine. And um, and this is where you want to eat it. But of course, after that, you're going to <laughs> you want to diet after that. This is you're going to walk fun. a lot in France, so you have the right to indulge. But what I love to do on my tours is take my group after that big dinner, and we walk down to the lower part of the town. And it's beautifully lit at night. It's just a surprise. I tell my group to just, you know, look at the ground. I turn them around and then I said, now look up. And it's impressive. I love, I love it. Parkinson. And this, so, just, this is what you see. This isn't some Disney thing. It is <laughs> It is taken probably with my iPhone. I don't know who took this picture, but this isn't some constructed image. It really looks like this. If ever you wanted a fairy tale castle at night. Wow, Carcassonne. Exactly. But I think we're going to move to the, the southeastern part of France now with you, uh, Steve. Shall I take over? All right. Yeah. Just a few hours due east uh, at the same latitude as uh, Languedoc, the area you were just in. Um, and you're, by the way, you were so close to Spain at that point, right? That you can mm -hmm. almost, uh, you know, smell the paella, right? Um, Provence, southeastern France. Um, boy, land of marvelous scenery. Uh, love. Yeah, if you're in the right time of year, June, late June, July, you get to see the lavender fields bloom. It's a gorgeous region of uh, beautiful scenery, small villages, and great cities. Provence is surprising to a lot of people because of its cities that are so interesting. I think one of my favorites is certainly Arles, and we highlight it in our guidebooks. And here in Arles, a city of about 50,000 people makes a great base for starting your sightseeing in the magnificent region of Provence. And that reminds me, we have a guidebook just on this region with the Riviera. We thought it was so important to cover in more detail. Here, looking at the city of Arles, you have the best sense of the Roman history here. You can tour the Roman theater in the center of my picture. And off to the left, if you look carefully where my little cursor is going, is the Roman theater for the more artistic types who liked, I don't know, plays and musicals rather than gladiator battles, right? What's cool about Arles, and I wish other cities in Europe would do this, is they've created a museum that you can visit that puts together what this city looked like 2,000 years ago. Then you walk out and visit it. There's the arena. Yep. Oh, there's the theater. And what? What? And, and here's the scale of the city, which is amazing, by the way, because 2,000 years ago, there was twice the population. There were 100,000 people living in Arles, where today there are only 50,000. What city do you know of has lost half of its population? That's an amazing accomplishment during the Roman Empire. The museum also reconstructs in these models, these big scale models, like the uh, the, the theater where you would go to see plays, et cetera, and gives you such a better understanding when you wander through the streets of Aro. Similarly, and you visit the arena today, which once again, hosted gladiators and today hosts matadors. There are both at certain times of the year here. Most of them are fun and silly events. So you don't have to worry about seeing a, a, a bull being hatcheted to death or whatever. They're mostly kind of almost clown-like sometimes and it's good fun to go. The city of Aro, like most Provencal cities, I think, is a great place to wander. It looks like this. It's sunny almost all the time, maybe a little bit windy, but wandering the streets of Aro, we we do a big, uh, in fact, there's an audio tour about to come out uh, from our walking tour of the city of Aro, principally because you can trace the footsteps of one of its more famous temporary residents, Vincent van Gogh. The art that you like of Vincent van Gogh was inspired and formulated here in the city of Arles. The sunshine, the sunflowers, the wind, everything dramatic blew this guy away. And you can go on the walking tour of the city of Arles where he set up his easel and you can find the same. This is an easel setup. Uh, the scenes he looked at as he painted them. And you are looking today, right now at that same Café de Nuit, right in front of you where the small three foot by three foot easel is located. We do a walking tour following the footsteps of Vincent van Gogh and also Arles makes a great place for day trips. So Roman ruins, by the way, for Arles, Vincent van Gogh sites, lovely town to wander, great base for hotels and restaurants. Nearby, if you feel like seeing a hill town in Provence, nothing is easier, more dramatic probably than the hill town of Lebo. Go early or late to avoid crowds. There's a great castle you can visit um, and wander through the old town. Uh, lovely to do at night. There are a few hotels in town if you feel like getting away. It's only about 15 minutes from the city of Arles. A half an hour north of the city of Arles is the twin capital, if you want to say, of sightseeing in Provence is Avignon. You know, the famous uh, nursery rhyme, sur le pont d'Avignon, on y danse, fame. 
Here in the 1300s, this claim to fame was where seven popes ruled for almost 100 years, and here is their home. This is the Vatican of France, where there was nothing going on in Rome at that time. It was all centered here. Well, there was something going on in Rome, but the power of the popes were here was here in Avignon for 100 years. Today, it's it's there aren't a lot. I mean, you can tour the Pope, Palace of the Popes. It's a lot of big empty rooms, I think, but there's some good views and a lot of history if you want. But more, it's a city of squares and pedestrian-only streets, big student population population, twice the size of the city of Arles, fun, lively place to wander, and also just a great base, a great base with good public transit uh, if you don't have a car to visit the great sites around the city of Arles, of Avignon, about 35 minutes away, probably, I don't know, maybe the certainly the most important Roman ruin you can see in France has to be the Pont du Gard, Pont Dugard here. Yeah, you can see it. Good. I have it tucked up there. This critical link of a 30 mile canal of water built 2000 years ago. Now think about this. Before the invention of mortar, only mortar was used at the very top part. Uh, these stones are just set in place very carefully, allowed water to run for 30 miles, dropping one inch for every 350 feet. So as not to create too much flow for bursting the pipes at the end, but not going too slow because, oops, otherwise you build up. What's this, Virginie? Ah, uh, this I love. I mean, I don't know how many whoa moments I have in France, and that's my country. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, honestly, it's a reason why it's the most visited country in the world. We actually, on our tour, we get to get a, a we actually walk where the water was. So yeah. you see how you can definitely see the stones that were built to make the passage of the water in the canal. And then all of that limestone deposit is just, you know, well, with years of having, centuries of having the water go through. And so you tuck your head and you go through. And it's it's pretty cool. I mean, this is... So we hire a guide on the tours of this. And yeah. independent travelers can do the same. But you have to book, if you're independent, book way ahead for this to make sure you get on one of those tours that takes you through the channel. Yeah. Uh, you know, fun little story. <laughs> you probably don't know this, but you used to be able to climb over the top of that sucker. Uh, and it's 900 feet long. It's the windiest part of France. There were no guardrails and there was no sign suggesting maybe you shouldn't be doing this. I used to love to talk about that in my talks, but we won't do that now. You take uh, it over. Now, where are we? Côte du Rhône. Uh, this is not Côte du Rhône, but I, I would bet that several of uh, you guys watching us are drinking probably a Côte du Rhône uh, wine. This is uh, the wine region of Provence with beautiful vineyards and stone villages uh, perched on the hillside, such as Vaison la Romaine, that uh, is great to use as a base. And you get two towns for the price of one. Isn't that great? Uh, Steve, can you point? Yes, thank you. Uh, this is the hotel, I mean, that most of our, our tours are staying right. at. I love it. I mean, they've stopped the, the Belfry Tower just a bit to the left of the hotel. It used to ring at night, the bell, like every hour. Uh, no longer the case. So you would think that's the old part of town. And it is old. I mean, it's from the Middle Ages. But then the oldest part of town in Vaison la Romaine, the Roman town, is actually 2,000 years old. And so by the river they have this uh, excavation still going on. Huh? The, it's the biggest excavation site in France, and that's also where the modern city is. So Vaison is a great base, and if you want to get more of the Roman uh, art, 30 minutes away by car, you are in Orange with the best preserved theater uh, in Europe with a massive stage, uh, stage wall. It's just, I mean, it's impressive. I remember... Uh, when I used to teach back in the in Bozeman, Montana, I took I organized a field trip for my uh, well, what a field trip, middle school kids to Europe. And I remember we were walking with a group of 30 kids here and the local kids are having their talent show, rehearsing their talent show on that stage. That's almost been there for 2000 years. I can tell you for the in the eyes of those Bozeman kids, this was just well, it was an eye opening moment. By the so, way. For those of you who don't know Virginie the way I do, in her house in the Beaujolais, southern part of Burgundy, she has an elk, I think, step ahead of <laughs> from your time living. <laughs> what other French person in the world? All right, I had to bring that up. Look at the scale of this the stage wall. That's what's so mind blowing. It's self standing with the scale of the people in this image. It's just incredible. 
And you have to imagine the acoustic there. I mean, those Romans, I mean, I mean, I know, Steve, you're an engineer by training. And yeah. I mean, the engineering in France, I mean, it's, it's, it's impressive. All over Europe, I'd say. Uh, and then in Provence, we have also Aix-en-Provence. Now, this is uh, a, bigger, a bigger town, very stylish, wealthy town with not so many big sites, but a great base to enjoy the art de vivre. I think you said that in English, too. You use so many French words. The art de vivre à la française. It has an outdoor market every day of the week and uh, beautiful flashy colors of Provence, the smell of Provence. And you're not far away from uh, Marseille, which is uh, a major seaport in France and also a very handy international airport. I love Marseille. Um, it, it's big, but it's it's just full of history. It's a, it has a distinctive culture. I love to spend time there. And I mean, you should definitely spend a day, you know, based in Aix-en-Provence or even stay overnight if you want in in, uh, in beautiful Marseille. I, you, you, I tell you who agrees with you is Rick. When I research with him and we're about to go, we're going to spend a week in this region of France uh, in uh, May this year. Um, he loves Marseille and he wants to get convince Americans not to be nervous about the city, but get there. And it's not far away, by the way, from where most Americans will go and land. There's the airport right there that my cursor is pointing to on a landfill, the city of Nice, the capital of the French Riviera now. We're out of Provence and into the Côte d'Azur. Nice, the fifth largest city in France on the Bay of Angels here is a, you know, I used to not like going here. And now they, the, God bless the French, they are making things better and better in so many places that I get to visit. Um, and it's thanks to getting rid of cars from the streets and squares and adding tramways like this. This image you're looking at is the Place Massena, the central square in Nice that used to be a ring road for cars. Now there is not one to be seen. It's a magnet. I love going here now. I love strolling the Promenade des Anglais so much that we I did a self-guided walking tour of the Promenade des Anglais. This broad, almost Champs-Élysées, if you want to call it, sidewalk bordering the Mediterranean Ocean, classic old hotels, a great history lesson about the or origination of resort or uh, uh, leisure time travel and tourism. I mentioned before that Nice was part of the Italian uh, principality, uh, we'll just call it part of Italy, until the mid 1800s. And so much of the city. They say ravioli was invented in Nice, and I think they're right about this. And you can visit the old town and feel its pulse, its Italian pulse, by wandering the old town, mixing it up at the Corsalea, buying your picnic lunch or how, whatever you're doing. And more than just fun uh, outdoors events like the Promo des Anglais and the old city of Nice, so many good art museums, museums from the artists in the 1900s, whether it's Chagall, Matisse, Frederick Leger, there are so many museums on display in this city and area. I think the Chagall Museum is probably the greatest. And we do a self-guided tour in our guidebooks guiding you through this museum. Nice is more than just beaches, in other words. And it's close to other destinations that we love too, right, Virginie? Yeah, we had a great time. We were sharing the book research this year in Nice. And it's, I mean, it's new restaurant scenes. It was just fun. You know, of, uh, we had a good time there. Good food, good wine. I, I cherish those, those moments. And so... From Nice, if you go east, easy to travel by bus or by uh, by train, um, you have the richest stretch of real estate in all of our friends. And you're going to have cliff hanging villages or small towns like Villefranche-sur-Mer, where it's easy going. Uh, you feel like you're in Italy more than in France. And it's close to the Cap Ferra with exclusive, very wealthy villas, but for you, the best sea sidewalks that you can get in the area. It's just beautiful uh, to walk uh, around the Cap Ferra. And Look then you at keep the scenery, your... by the way. The Alps, the Alps start right there. You can tell the oh, Alps yeah. start right there. And the, those seaside walks, I mean, I always, I don't have to do it to update the book every year, but I do it because I like them so much. Oh, you could People. you could be skiing and I mean swimming in the morning and skiing in the afternoon in winter time. Yep. That's the beauty of the French Riviera. And then you keep on your train or your bus journey east and you arrive in Monaco. Now, this is not France. I mean, they speak French. French, it, it feels a bit like French, but this is a, the, the minuscule principality. And it has a few sites. It's nice to spend a day. Um, you can visit the palace of, uh, of the prince, Prince Albert's palace with the changing of the guard uh, every day, just a little bit before noon. And it attracts lots of people because the royalty is a big deal. No longer in France, but in Monaco, it is still. Or you just go next door to the palace and you have this huge aquarium, which was um, 
uh, for a long time, it was managed by Cousteau. With beauty, you step out from one room and you have beautiful views over the Mediterranean Sea. And then the last big site that uh, you have to see in Monaco is the casino, which was built when Monaco became independent, late 1800. And I mean, I've been to Vegas. This is a way to lose money with elegance. Yeah. It's also money, but... a heck of an economic uh, shot in the arm to help this, this place turn into one of the wealthiest places of the world, right? I'm going to mm -hmm. take us north. I'm going to move us along, Virginie, so we finish on time. And... Uh, up into the Alps. I mentioned before, the Alps flow right down into the Riviera. It's astonishing. And a, oh, a, a good fair shot north. We're going to head into the heart of the high Alps here in the Alps uh, sub, in the Savoie region, starting on the Lake of Annecy here. Annecy is how the French pronounce it. A glorious translucent lake uh, with a bike path that, that you can see on the right side that circles much of the lake. A level bike ride, rollerblade roll or walking stroll where you can walk from village to village or ride from village to village and maybe take your bike bike or your body on a boat to return to your home base, whether it's a village or the city of Annecy that we'll talk about shortly. These boats, I think our tours do cruises on these boats, don't they? You can do just a, a, an hour cruise. I like the I prefer the boats that stop village to village because I like to get off as I recommend in the book, and hike up above my favorite town of Talwar. And this is about a 40-minute hike above Talwar with this spectacular view. And by the way, most of the time, there are hand gliders out there in the distance. It is, looks, I just took this picture. I think I was there in June this year. Um, and little boats, and then you got to run back down, catch the boat to go, continue on to villages further up the lake. Man, that's good fun. And the best base for this area, it's 50,000 population city, but Annecy, Annecy is just a lovely city. I mean, it's probably, the, I think it's one of the most beautiful cities in France and maybe all of Europe. Laced with canals and little river walkways. It is arcaded streets, lovely restaurants, um, a fun place to go. And we, uh, my tour, the, the My Way tour, spends a couple nights here. And uh, we have our other tours that uh, stop on the day on their way up to, because for most Americans, they got to get one with the Alps, right? So if it's the high Alps, you must see slide your sled north of Annecy, about an hour and a half, and meet the city of Chamonix, where every street is named for a mountain climber or an alpinist, and Mont Blanc, you're staring right at it at 15,770 feet, towers over you with peaks hemming you in on all sides. It is the place for alpine exploration in France, and I think one of the greatest places in Europe for this. Every tech, method of technology ever invented to get you up and into the mountains, from cogwheel trains like this one to Montanvert, get you up to the, uh, uh, you're looking at what you, the white thread that you're looking at here up this valley is called the Mer de Grasse, the longest glacier in France. And you'll learn a lot about how glaciers are melting. And I won't go into detail now, but it's a powerful way of understanding global warming. And it's also a good base for hiking in the area. And this, with much, not much effort, that's the beauty of Europe. Those gondolas and those trains do the sweat for you. And you can just top it off with these hikes up a little bit further to get these grand views like this. But the highlight and this is the highlight, the must for most people going to Chamonix. By the way, Chamonix, first site of the Winter Olympics in 1924, right? There's a reason for it. All this that you get to see. And there is Mont Blanc, and you're going right on the edge of Mont Blanc, transferring from one gondola to another to get to 13,000 feet. And this station at the top of the world, where you and your partner can take pictures looking at the Matterhorn in Switzerland in the distance, Mont Refugio into Italy on the right side. And of course, you're based right at the border of France, Italy, and Switzerland in this image. But wow, right? I mean, you're not hiking from here. Maybe you're skiing from here if you're a better skier than I am. But man, but the sightseeing doesn't end here. If thrills are something you seek, you can join <laughs> your partner and dangle for 45 minutes at 12,500 feet as you cross the most spectacular border crossing into Italy and then drop down on a similar kind of gondola situation uh, into Courmayeur uh, and Esta on the other side of the Alps. What a way to cross a border. Now, this, this the teacups that I like to call them are very much weather dependent. Mid-May through mid-September, many of the lifts in Chamonix. But boy, if you're there at that time of year, taking the Hillbroner um, teacups, uh, yeah, it's just remarkable opportunity. All right. It's just downhill. Uh, man, it's two hours to my house from those yeah. Alps. I love it. Go ahead, Virginie. This, in fact, um, this, go ahead. This is my village. This yeah. is Burgundy, the place, the area of France with rolling hills, 
quiet villages and just what we call the France profonde, profound France. So it's just quiet and just pretty wherever you go. And so that's where I decided to settle, even though I'm from uh, Western France after 13 years living abroad. And that's also where uh, Steve has a home. And the good base to explore Burgundy is Beaune. Uh, it's a popular prosperous town where you go from one wine uh, shop to another wine shop. And it has one beautiful site, which is the Hotel uh, Dieu. And uh, this looks like um, a beautiful mansion. However, it was a medieval charity hospital, which is now turned into a museum. And the reason to also stay in Bone uh, is also for its beautiful market. And, uh, uh, you know, Burgundy must have the best food of France. Uh, this is when you have escargot, uh, boeuf bourguignon, oeuf en meurette. Oeuf en meurette is, you know, we, we cook a lot with wine in Burgundy, but it's when you have poached eggs in a oh, red yeah. sauce. And so the food is amazing. The markets have to be uh, amazing, of course. And um, again, it's one of those towns where you get a stroll after your hearty Burgundian dinner and <laughs> lots of lots of um, buildings are lit and it's just a beautiful stroll. It's it's just very nice, nice way to, you have to enjoy. I know in the US, you tend to eat early, you tend to go to bed early, but you're on vacation in Europe. And at night, it's just a different feel. Really, really a nice way to enjoy. And of course, Bone is surrounded by vineyards. Um, this is the most, these are the most famous and the most expensive red wines in the world. We're talking about Pinot Noir and Chardonnay for the white. And this might be, I mean, if you, if you don't know much about, uh, about wine, you think, okay, Burgundy is gonna be easy. Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, red or white. It's actually way more complex than that, but it's the beauty because when you're on a tour, whether you're on your own or with a guide, you get to learn about the, the beauty, the complexity of wine, and you get to also not just drink it, you get to enjoy the vineyards here, Steve, on one of those uh, quiet uh, working roads. I, I mean, I don't know what your favorite season is, Rick, but I mean, I love when it's harvest time and you pick up a bike and you hear all of the, the grape pickers speaking all of those languages because they come from everywhere in, in, in Europe. And this is neat. So, you know, there's not there's not a better place to bike. I mean, all these these little lanes that you see are only used by uh, vineyard maintenance, little tractors and trucks. And so they're, they're, it's like bike lanes everywhere because there's just no conflicting traffic. Right. I just obviously love it. And so does Rick. Yeah. yeah. And so Burgundy for a while, historically, it used to be independent and it was actually a, a big region that was wealthier than the French kingdom. And so they were, there are castles everywhere. And today, of course, uh, you have to maintain those castles. When on our Best of Eastern France tour, we go to the Chateau de Ruy, we actually get to meet a count. So even though we had the French Revolution, this is Raoul. So yeah. he's wearing jeans, a shirt. Surprise. <laughs> to meet like ex, you know nobility and so Raoul is taking you into his home and then uh, you learn about the, the wine uh, that he makes on his estate and it just creates a great moment bonding sharing wine learning about uh, learning about wine so oh yeah oh and beautiful. then oh, this, aha oh. burgundy now i know we've been taking you to many places we talked about the gothic age the middle ages it's very hard if you come from america to relate to this and on your way back north from uh from the wine region of Burgundy. I mean, if you're a historian, even if you're not a historian, just to, to understand better the architecture, you have to go to Guédelon. They're actually building a castle like they would have built it in the 13th century. I mean, I've been guiding for Rick for 10 years now, and it, I mean, it keeps, I mean, it's, it's getting bigger and bigger. This is, whoa, to learn about the, the architecture of, uh, of the Middle Ages. It's great. We have you, you love that place, Steve. Our family tours just go nuts here. Yeah, and and obviously we do tours focused on kids and families. And boy, this is Disneyland, but it's real. They're using tools and techniques only used in the 1300s, as you say, yeah. And then on your way uh, back north, you can stop in a, what is an authentic small town of Bourges. Uh, it has the most uh, half-timbered houses in France. And there are not many Americans here. I, I, you, we know we stay in Bourges on the Heart of France tour. And I mean, the people at the market, they're starting to pick up a bit of English because they've had this American <laughs> have to feed themselves. I bring them to the market and said, here you go. If you want lunch today, you get to speak some French. And Bourges has an amazing cathedral. I, 
I think it's my favorite. It's both massive, it has five naves, which is quite unusual for a cathedral, but it's also very delicate. You see the back here with the, the, the very fine uh, flying buttresses. So Bourges and also a lit at night, uh, another beautiful stroll to digest. You'll never say that you eat too much in France at dinner. We're seeing, yeah, we're lots of these, yeah, lots of these uh, night shots. I, I'll continue. P pardon me, Virginia. I'll keep us on schedule. Three hours north of that of the area of Burgundy, the Alsatian region. Um, you're looking at the the Vosges Mountains, the soft Vosges Mountains in the distance. And historically, the the Germans thought the Vosges Mountains that you're looking at should be the border, whereas the French thought the thought the Rhine River should be the border. Consequently, the area of Alsace has been like ping pong, bouncing back and forth between German and French. And today it is definitively French, but with a very uh, bicultural aspect where you have sauerkraut with fine wine sauces. And I love the Route du Vin that you're looking at here, partly because the wines here are so utterly different than anywhere else in France. They have a definite Germanic quality to them. The villages are very Germanic. Hansel and Gretel that I mentioned before, it is just a gorgeous ribbon of asphalt road that connects villages like Rickvier or storybook villages like Egesheim here. I love basically myself in the little village of Egesheim with good hotels and good restaurants, but probably for the most part, the best base for visiting the Alsace, uh, almost on the Rhine River, is the city of Colmar, a city of about 80,000 people. And it really looks like this. It is so well preserved. It's very Germanic. You won't see architecture like this anywhere else in France. Colorful buildings, and it's absolutely lovely at night. One more time, the buildings aren't lit in the way you've seen before, like sound and light. They do this uplighting that just makes the, the safe, pedestrian-only streets of Colmar a joy to wander at night and just extend your sightseeing into the evenings and digesting your heavy uh, Germanic cuisine here, your sauerkraut cuisine after dinner. But Komar is more than just a pretty place to base yourself. There are some heavyweight sightseeing opportunities here. One of the great museums and one of Rick's favorite museums in all of Europe is the Unterlinden Museum. It's a, a fine historical museum ranging from ancient art to modern art, really, but it's highlight is the Isenheim altarpiece. And it's really, this is just one of the panels of a, a polyptic painting that sort of opened and closed like shutters and was originally intended in a hospital to, to help people deal with terrible diseases like ergotism or St. Anthony's fire. And this is wild. This was painted at the same time that Michelangelo was painting the uh, Sistine Chapel. And look at how wild these figures look. It, there's something going on here in this in uh, Matthias Grunewald's uh, painting that is just and there are five panels that you can visit in the in, in the Unterlinden Museum. Man, this is, do you take groups in here, Virginie, when you're on tour? Yes, we do have a guided tour of Colmar. Yeah. And it is it is very graphic to learn about those diseases of the Middle Ages, but you, you have to understand, we show you the beauty of the Gothic churches. And well, it was not that easy all the time, I guess. Right, and the idea when I say help, people suffering from diseases was that Christ suffered as well. And this portrays it more than just a beautiful painting. It shows the agony, doesn't it? Very well. There's another museum nearby dedicated to local town boy, uh, uh, August Bartoli, who sculpted the uh, Statue of Liberty. And he loved triumphant liberty generated kind of sca statues. You see them throughout France and main squares of cities and towns. And his museum is small and fun to see. And for, particularly for Americans, this is the guy who built, who sculpted our Statue of Liberty. All right, we're just about back to Paris, aren't we? And as Virginie likes to say, Steve, you do war, I do bubbles. And so I'm gonna do <laughs> this tough site because halfway back to Paris from the Alsace is an important site to see again for Americans uh, the the battlefields of Verdun World War 1 1914 to 1918 uh, the war to end all wars they said and the war that uh, in this ossuaire this house of bones up the top this odd kind of looking building that you see surrounded by the cemetery are the bones of over 100,000 Frenchmen and double that for the number of Germans housed in the basement of that structure, wandering out into the cemetery and looking at the films and the museums that you can visit in one three hour, four hour, I think, would that be about right for visiting the fields of Verdun? Do you think Virginie, three, four hours, half day? That's it. A half you day is great. I mean, of course you can spend more time, but a half day gives you a good perspective of what World War One was about in the trenches. Yeah. Right. And this, remember, was a battle fought with modern technology, the first time poisonous gas, airplanes, machine guns, tanks were used, using old strategic 
uh, plans of, of generals that just didn't work. 300,000 people would die in those trenches in the course of one year. That's astonishing, the battlefields of Verdun, right? And the, the forts that you see constructed are so utterly different than anything we saw with World War II or that you're used to seeing in the battlefields of Verdun. It's a real powerful history lesson. The nice thing that the French did was though, they located the, the Champagne region afterwards so we can cheer up a little bit after that sobering experience, right Virginie? Yes, the famous Champagne, Champagne, as we say in French, is just an hour away by train from Paris. And that's a good way for us to finish our tour de France. And uh, to explore Champagne, you go to Reims, what you call Reims, that we call Reims. Everybody should get practicing in front of their screen, Reims. It's a lively, full of uh, history uh, town. I mean, it it bubbles like champagne is flowing like cool aid in the US on a summer day, right? <laughs> like, you know, we have a different way of celebrating here. Um, it's it's a lively uh, it's a lively town with a modern feel, but you still have the history, a uh, beautiful cathedral and World War One, World War Two history and also some Roman uh, ruins because the Romans, you know, conquered over there. Now, this is a glorious example of Gothic architecture. Uh, the city of Reims has been important for the coronation of most of the French kings. And this cathedral was actually, it's a miracle that it's uh, still standing. I mean, we owe the fact that you can see today to American money, uh, mainly the Rockefeller, but this was hit by 300 shells during uh, World War One, it, it was the biggest city on, on you know closest to the to the front, and so in addition to of course visiting the cathedral and the lovely town, you have to go uh, taste some champagne, some bubbles, learn about how it's made, and mm -hmm. how it is appreciated in France, and then just under uh, your feet in the champ in in the city of France, you have quarries, uh, cray uh, quarries. And this is where they age the wine. This is where they store the wine. And so on our tour, uh, you, you can tour any of the big names, uh, you know, Moom, Tetanger, all of those, or you can go to a, a not so well-known um, champagne brand. Uh, that's a, a seller we go to and, uh, you know, go deep inside. And some of those uh, sellers' quarries were actually, uh, actually dating from the Roman time. So uh, here we are, we've, we've done well in just a bit over an hour. Uh, I think it would be a, a good reason to pop up some uh, champagne to celebrate the France, right? You're I still on I your feet. Hey, yes, and to, to draw a conclusion to this, so we have all the destinations we cover on our tour. We, Virginie and I hit one way or the other, whether it's the Week in Paris tour or the Paris and Heart of France tour. You see Bourges, Loire Valley, Mont Saint-Michel, Normandy. The Western France tour, Loire to the south of France, starting in Chartres outside of Paris, as Virginie mentioned, going to Chinon um, um, and still seeing Chinon, so Sarlat in the Dordogne region, Carcassonne, the big fortified city the Roman city of Arles and Provence and ending with two nights in Nice to the Eastern France tour, uh, starting in the Champagne country, by the way, so easy to get to from downtown Paris, going through the battlefields of Verdun into the countryside of the Alsace, into our hometown of Bonn in one sense, right, Virginie, up to the Alps, Chamonix and Annecy covered, and then down in Provence through vaison la romand ending in Aix-en-Provence. The My Way Tour covers these same destinations and just, or some of these destinations in just a different way. And again, is designed for people who want their own free time. It's about $1,000 cheaper, I think, than our fully guided tour because it includes less and a lot of that less is, is a real full, fully guided tour experience. The, our tours include, if you're interested in, in taking a tour, the most important thing is a good guide, as I as I mentioned before. Accommodations, all the tips are covered and included, all the breakfasts, about half your dinners, guidebooks, and all of our knowledge that Virginia and I and Rick and Gene Openshaw and all the, the excellent book staff that we have at Rick Steves put into our books go also into the tours that we do. This reminds me that if you sign up again, you're eligible to win a free city tour, but you got to get on that ricksteves.com give, giveaway website to get a free city tour. Speaking for all of our guides, many of whom I got to hire in my lucky time of uh, managing the, the guide services with Rick at Rick Steves Europe, speaking for them and and thanking you, Virginie, for staying up. What time? It must be four something in the morning. I don't even want to know what time it is where it's you are. It's 421. 421. Bless you. Thank you. Um, and and from all of us to the people who've uh, hung in there during this talk, merci beaucoup. Bon voyage. Uh, and next on the list, I think Gabe is uh, Ireland coming up, isn't it? 
Oh, yes. And we want to welcome, uh, hope that you all embrace French culture as Virginie and I love to do on your next trip to France. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Steve. And we have some great questions from the audience. Um, first, you may have mentioned this. I could have missed it while I was typing some replies, but um, Ellen is wondering, what is the update on the current status of Notre Dame and the reconstruction? Um, is it going to be done in time for the Olympics next year? So it, it, took, <laughs> it took over 150 years to build it. And even though we're in the 21st century and we have the best technology, it will go faster than 150 years, of course. Uh, the president said 2024 it's open because of the Olympic Games. The idea they have is the, the front, so the big esplanade you have in front, to be more open so you can see the facade. And they're talking about organizing, organizing a way to enter the cathedral. But it cannot be by 2024 the way it used to be before, where you had a single line to go in and you know out. So we, I mean, you know, France, we we have the Olympic Games coming, and it's you know we'll see, I guess. But I mean, as I said, from the outside, it's still just beautiful. And if you want to go inside uh, inside a cathedral, you just go on the train to Chartres, and you'll have um, a, a beautiful experience inside. And yeah, I, by the way, that's a good, really good point, uh, the, Gabe, that I think is worth making to Ellen, is that there are other, there's so many other great Gothic cathedrals to see. I think the beauty of, of Notre Dame for me has always been from the outside anyway. It's sitting on the river, on the La Cité. The, I, I prefer Chartres and Reims on the interior anyway. And anyway, yeah. A couple other questions about Paris, since we started our, our tour this evening there. Um, Nancy is wondering, do you recommend to people getting a Paris museum pass, even with all the timed entry um, things, is that still a good deal on average? A absolutely. Yeah. Virginie, you think so too? Yeah, we both yes, agree. And honestly, the, the timed entry was, you know, when things reopen, uh, you know, it, it, they wanted to limit the amount of uh, the, the, the size of the, the people, the groups going in. And I think now, I mean, you, it's easy when you have a museum pass for the Louvre, for example, you just go into their website and you choose a time, you have a pass, you don't pay a ticket and you go in. It's still worth it. I mean, we have two days, three days and six day pass that are really worth it. The, the other advantage, by the way, and I, I love this question, by the way, Nancy, thank you. The museum pass, there's so many museums that don't require a reservation, really, that are small that you might not otherwise think, do I want to spend 10 euros to get in here? It's free. You got the pass. You just flash it and walk in. Man, that that's uh, uh, and places like uh, Le Arc de Triomphe. It's open till 11 at night or 1030 at night. It works. And until you get to, to night. skip the line, too. I mean, the Arc de Triomphe yeah. is a good example of how you see that picture in the line. There are two lines and you have the people waiting. And the people showing their pass and just zipping through the, the line. So it's 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 really a, a good deal if you're planning to spend time in museums. One other uh, Paris question is, I know that there's a little bit of a stereotype um, that Parisians can be a little bit brusque with Americans. Um, and Sharon is wondering, do you think that that stereotype is true? Or how can American visitors um, uncover the warmer side of Parisians. Ah, uh, take it away, Steve. Yeah, I've lived for eleven years in the U.S. and people are so polite. They were just telling me, "But, but you're not French. You're nice." And I thought, <laughs> okay. Now, Paris is a big city. It's like New York. And I remember, I, I mean, I didn't live in New York. I lived in Bozeman. And how they here? How they there? <laughs> it was just strange to me. It's just a cultural knowledge. We, I mean, you wouldn't say howdy to people in the streets of New York, but in the, I mean, the Parisians, as long as you follow the rules, and we are a very formal culture. I mean, we teach young kids at the age of two to greet people formally, bonjour madame, bonjour monsieur, using the keywords. As long as you use those keywords, the people are going to open up. Now, if you go into a, a conversation and you go straight, a very American way of, I want this, for the French, you are the one being rude. You know, it's just a matter of seeing things. You think the French are rude, you didn't use the right keyword. And that's that's part of my job. I love teaching people about culture because we have beautiful sites with a beautiful culture, but there is such a way of dealing with the French that all of those stereotypes go away. And I mean, 
whether it's in Paris or the rest of France, just you don't need to speak French fluently. You just need to practice, even if you butcher it. Don't you agree, Steve? I mean, you yeah. speak French, so it's easy for you, yeah. but. Right. But that's one thing Virginie brought to the guidebooks, Gabe, that, that I'm thinking is that uh, that understanding that she just explained to you and helping us interpret French mannerisms, et cetera, in our guidebooks. Because we give, I think, good background on that same kind of thing. And I tell you, I'm the one who gets all the reader feedback, right? And if it's one common feedback piece of feedback I get is, I couldn't believe how nice the Parisians were. I couldn't believe it. And and certainly going with an open mind, that last image I showed, I used to, when I gave these talks, say that most, most Americans fear the waiters in their cafe. And by the end of the trip, they're going back to France because of the waiters, not in spite of them. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Slow down, right? Don't expect things to happen. I had to learn that lesson. I, you know, boy, did I ever. And re renovating that farmhouse, Virginie. And you'll succeed much greater than if you're in an American hurry. Mm -hmm. um, I know that another kind of um, French pastime, another stereotype of the French is that they love um, a good strike. And really? sometimes that <laughs> impacts travel. Uh, and we have some people wondering, how can you prepare for the possibility of strikes um, or avoid them while traveling? Uh, come spend money in France. The more money we make, the less we'll complain about having to be <laughs> later. No, I, uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's not probability. I mean, it is probable you, you are going to enter. I bet you do. It, certain, there are certain times of the year, right, Virginia, that the strikers yeah, are more likely. Exactly. But the good thing is now, unlike I would say 10, 20 years ago, they warn you ahead of time and there has to be a backup plan. For example, if you plan to travel by train within France, they have to run. They cannot go there for two weeks in a row with no trains. So if it happens, then there is a backup plan. And I, you know, I, back in 2019, I was leading a Paris tour in December when we had the Yellow Vest movement. We mm -hmm. find a way, it was beautiful weather. We walked, we did what the Parisians did. And you know, you're on vacation. We are fighting. I mean, the French are fighting for things that in America looks like, really? I mean, free healthcare, free education, retiring at the age of 62. Mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's a revolutionary country still today. And it's part of the culture. You have to embrace it. I mean, we find it frustrating. You may find it frustrating, but you have to, to step down and just think, you know, this is part of traveling. We are learning about the culture too. And, and it, it works well. I mean, and when you're on a, on a tour, we make it work anyway. You don't have to, uh, to deal with that hassle. I have to do with it. <laughs> I like your answer. And I also want to say, practically speaking, too, your hotelier is going to know what's happening. There are websites to avoid strikes. The SNCF, the train system, has a website just to, that helps you navigate around them as well. But your hotelier, now, if you're staying in an Airbnb, you're, you're not going to do as well. This is one reason I like hotels, is you have a staff there trained, and they are used to helping you navigate around the strikes. And usually, they're kind of like weather patterns here. They're more bluster than they really turn out to be. Right, Virginie? Yeah, but, exactly. You know, and I mean, we're talking about what? maybe 10 days in the year. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, it's like when people visit Seattle, I always say, if it's sunny, then then you just got lucky. And if it's raining, you're having an authentic experience. <laughs> so I suppose if you go and you avoid strikes, fortunate for you, if you have, if you have one though, an authentic cultural experience. You're hired, Gabe, I like it. <laughs> I'm already hired. <laughs> oh, that's right. um, <laughs> another question um, from Melissa is, what are some of your favorite places for outdoor adventures in France? If you had to pick your favorite. Oh, that, this is where Virginie are on this. We are both nature kids. Oh, baby. Um, boy, where to start and where to end. It depends if you're biking, biking everywhere in France. They are constructing so many bike lanes, bike paths. Almost anywhere is brilliant for that. For real outdoor adventure, I love the uh, Grand Canyon of the Verdun, Virginie. I mean, hiking down into the river. I, I showed that one image of the Grand Canyon. That is just spectacular. And for Americans, there you won't run into anybody out there who is American. Um, what about you, Virginie? That's one of my uh, favorite places to that's go. A great question, Melissa. And mm -hmm. I love the um, I love the Alps. I mean, it's living in uh, in southern Burgundy. I'm about two hours, two hours and a half away from Chamonix. And I mean, we went this summer, met with some friends, took a backpack, we put the tent in the mountains. It's, I mean, I've lived in in Montana where the outdoor is. I mean, it, this is the best outdoor life I've ever had. But you have the way to find that in in France too, and uh, the Alps for me. Yeah. There's but, another I mean, another tip. There are other parts of France like that. You know, just. Uh, 
you know, parts where, you know, the massive central that you mentioned, Steve, where nobody really goes to when it's just rolling hills, old volcanoes. Yeah. There, there's a system of trails, they call them Grand Randonnée in France, that connect village to village, region to region. The, the Brits are famous for this, walking across England, right? But the French do it too. And these Grand Randonnées take you from village to village, and you can crisscross the country if you want to. Um, you can walk the whole the whole coastline of France, which is super long, just on what we call the GR, the Grand Randonnée Trail, from uh, from the top north to, to the French Riviera. And you know what? Uh, this reminds me, if Rick's watching, uh, he and uh, his one of his friends recently did the uh, Tour de Mont Blanc or part of it. And I think we even filmed parts of it, too, as well. That's around Chamonix. That is a brilliant hut to hut hiking kind of adventure, too. Um, another question. I mean, both of you have have worked on our guidebook and France is a place that many people have preconceptions about. They have places that they're excited about. It has a lot of tourism. I'm curious, what's maybe one place that is on people's radar that at this point you wouldn't recommend or you feel like is over-touristed? And what's one place that you view as kind of a less discovered gem? Wow. Ooh, that's tough. Uh, that, that's an interesting question because, I mean, we live in a world now, I mean, you go to Europe where it's been discovered and um, but I think I would say you just have to time well and you have to plan ahead what you want to do. Like we, we mentioned the Mont Saint-Michel. If you go to the Mont Saint-Michel, I'll tell you the story of my brother. I mean, we, we grew up next to the Mont Saint-Michel and a few years ago, he took his kids there and they went at two o'clock and he told me, oh, shoot, I should have asked you. And I said, yes, you should have asked me. You know, you just have to plan it well because of course those places are popular and you're not the only one who wants to go there, but there is a way to plan it so you you enjoy the crowds. Now, talking about a place which is um, you know outside of the radar, I mean, sorry, but I would say Brittany, <laughs> explore Brittany. I mean, it's just beautiful. Uh, even in the middle of summer, when all of the French, the Europeans are on vacation, mm. it's just a beautiful coastline, and and you'll be away from the crowds for sure. I can answer the place I wouldn't go. Saint-Tropez, Cannes, those places, we lowball them in the book. We, we say it like it is. I mean, we still have to list it and some people really like it. So we list it, but boy, uh, that's where in Cannes, Rick likes to say, and it, this is typical of Rick, you can buy an ice cream cone at the train station and tour all the key sites in Cannes before your ice cream is melted and before you finish with it. <laughs> Yeah, those are just overrated. I mean, because of the film festival, to me, superficial, unappealing places. The I think in terms of uh, Virginia, I bet you agree with me, lesser known areas that I would love to explore more. So parts of the Dordogne region, the Eastern part, I just really love around Rocamadour and further East inland there, as well as the Ardèche Gorges, which are a little bit North of Provence. These are brilliant areas, beautiful stone towns that there's so much in this country that's un not uncovered, that's not covered yet. Um, and last one, the Lot River, L-O-T River is, mm -hmm. uh, we used to do it on our Vineyards and Villages tour of France, our Slow Dance Through France tour. We'd spend three nights on the Lot River in the center of France. And I, I don't cover it anymore in the guidebook and I wish I could get back there somehow. All right, well, Steve and Virginie, I have one last question for you. It is perhaps the most difficult one. It comes from Richard and Richard wants to know, what in what is your all-time favorite quintessential French dish? Ooh, ooh. Ah, Whoa. well, I'm going to stay yeah. away from all of the stereotypes. <laughs> but I'll leave that to you, Steve. But for me, having lived a long time abroad, I remember when I would come back to France, my mom would say, my mom loves to cook. What would you want me to cook? You know, for you, you're coming back for two weeks. What would you like? And my husband and I, what we would do, the first thing, we would stop at a bakery and just order a jambon beurre. This is a real piece oh. of baguette. <laughs> with remember. butter, salted butter, of course, oh. and real ham. Not, sorry, but the watery, honey ham that you have in the States. And this is going to blow your mind away with just three simple ingredients. The sandwich, you know, the, just the basic French sandwich. Sorry, I mean, there's too much otherwise, I can't choose. <laughs> That's the, you have to try at least once. Don't take what we call the American sandwich. We have a sandwich American. And that's the, the sandwich where we put everything in it. Tomatoes, lettuce, eggs, ham, butter, mayo. Just stay away from that one. It's a bit too much, but just the jambon beurre. 
I remember when when you first started helping me with the guidebooks, I really lowballed that sandwich and you really changed my mind on that. I want to thank you for that, Virginie. Uh, I do have an open mind and I and I was converted to Jean Bonbeur, uh, who <laughs> I think my favorite is, is uh, Marguerite de Canard. I love the cuisine in the Dordogne. I love... Uh, there are dishes that Americans don't eat that we just don't understand. And Seattle will eat some of it, but duck is so good. And the canard, the duck in, in the Dordogne region, but anywhere that they serve it or confit de canard, but Marguerite de canard is my favorite. There you go. And a dish that Americans aren't used to. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to find. I remember I, I found duck back in Bozeman and I had to order it with special order. It with the butcher. We eat duck at least. I mean, it's on every single menu in, in France. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> well, I think uh, Ireland is coming up next, followed by Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and a couple of other talks. And and again, Virginie, bless you and thank you, my dear friend and one of my favorite colleagues for staying up as late as you have or getting up <laughs> and, and being awake at this hour. I can't wait to see you when we research together in April. I know I get to see you before too long. Merci beaucoup. And to all the viewers, thanks for, uh, for your participation in this and for your patience in uh, sticking with us. Merci, Steve, and thank you to all of us for, for having, uh, joining us tonight. Bonne nuit, uh, chère madame. Merci. Bonne nuit. Hope to see you all tomorrow. Okay, Gabe. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.